the stars are just the beginning. Where does our universe end? Where does it begin? When we look up at our night sky, it seems impossible to count the number of stars. And yet our universe contains 33 billion billion times as many stars than we can see with the naked eye. The true extent of our cosmos is seemingly beyond the comprehension of any human. Out there are stars 2,000 times the size of our sun. Immense clouds of dust and gas, thousands of light years in diameter, in which new stars are being born. And there are black holes with a mass 66 billion times that of our star, more than most galaxies. These magnificent curiosities are amongst the few that we have discovered. And yet, as bizarre as they are, they are nothing compared to the mysteries we are yet to unravel. The stars are just the beginning. I'm Damon Scotting, and this is Astronomical. Now our long distant ancestors depended on the stars for their very survival. They used certain constellations as a signal for the coming of winter. They alerted them to move on in search of food. Now, however, our relationship with the stars is pretty much non-existent. We don't depend on them in any way whatsoever. If you were to venture to a remote location, away from these dense city lights and the air pollution, then you'd likely see as many 6,000 stars with the naked eye. But if you came to somewhere like here, central London, then you'd be lucky to see as many as 60 stars. But imagine how much differently we'd look at our lives if we could see as many stars as our long distant ancestors or even the Greeks and Romans saw. These little problems that we get so worked up over wouldn't seem as important compared to the grand scale of the universe. So let's just imagine for a moment what London would look like without any air or light pollution. This is how London would look if you could just see the stars in the night sky. The Bortle scale is a way of ranking the night sky's brightness in a particular location. There are nine levels, with one being an excellent location with no pollution, allowing you to see the full cosmos, and nine being the worst. Each year, more and more of our planet becomes a location where the Bortle scale is nine. But even at a high number, it doesn't mean you can't enjoy the stars in our night sky. My own back garden is a 6 on the Bortle scale, but I can still see plenty. Now for the majority of us, Orion is the most famous constellation there is. And that is largely in part because it's the most easily identifiable constellation in our night sky. In fact, I bet when you step out at night and look up at the stars, amongst the first ones you look for are the three that make up Orion's belt. The constellation itself is a sight to behold. It contains a rich variety of stars, red, white, and blue. But even the ancient Greeks couldn't have possibly envisioned the wonders that lied just beyond our naked eye capabilities. Just below Orion's belt is its sword, and within that is the great Orion Nebula. The Orion Nebula is effectively a stellar nursery. It's an immense cloud of dust and gas in which stars are born. For me, seeing the Orion Nebula for the first time for a telescope was a major turning point in my life. There are few things more majestic and magical than a colossal cloud of dust and gas in which stars are born. The idea itself is something even beyond what the Greeks may have imagined in their time, and yet it is true. And best of all, you can appreciate it in all of its glory with even the most basic telescope or pair of binoculars. 
In comparison to the Orion Nebula, our stellar neighbourhood is dwarfed. And this is just the beginning. Now as brilliant of a sight as the Orion Nebula is, it is not alone in our night skies. In fact, with a standard telescope like this, you can see thousands of other nebulas. The nearest of which is just a bit further up to the left. Besides the first star that makes up Orion's belt, you can see the Horsehead Nebula. Now the ancient Greeks were very imaginative with their stories. However, modern day astronomers are a bit more blunt when it comes to naming astronomical objects. They call it as they see it. The nebula looks like a horse's head, the Horsehead Nebula. Alongside it is the Flame Nebula. It is an emission nebula 12 light years wide. It's estimated to be a couple hundred of light years closer to us than the horse's head. Whereas the horse's head is a dark nebula. The thick dust blocks the light from behind it. It seems impossible to imagine it, as there really isn't much context, but this cloud of dust and gas in space is far larger than our entire solar system. A small reminder of the unbelievable vastness of our universe. Do you see that small cluster of stars just above my head? These are the Pleiades, otherwise known as the Seven Sisters. Now the ancient Greeks had a lot of time on their hands back when there were no phones. And one of the things they enjoyed doing was creating constellations in which they connected the stars to one another in order to create stories. And amongst these stories was that of the Seven Sisters. The Seven Sisters were being pursued by Orion the Hunter. He followed them in a mad lust until Zeus heard their cries for help and cast them upon our night sky. Then, a few years later, when Orion the Hunter was killed by a scorpion, he himself took his place amongst the stars and is now seen every single winter in pursuit of the Seven Sisters. If you look just below the Pleiades, you'll see the constellation of Taurus the Bull, shaped a lot like a V. It's at the tip of this constellation that there is a remnant of a dead star that we can still see today. This is the Crab Nebula. The Crab Nebula went supernova almost a thousand years ago in 1054 AD. And its explosive death was witnessed here on Earth by Chinese astronomers. They recorded it in their night sky and said the brightness lasted for 23 days. The supernova explosion was so bright that it could be seen during the daytime and appeared as a second sun. As they monitored the bright point of light over the next couple of weeks, they noticed its position in the sky did not change, which meant it could not be a comet. Imagine if they knew now what they were in fact looking at, was the explosive death of a star 10 times the size of our own sun. Our Milky Way galaxy contains somewhere between 100 billion to 1 trillion stars. But what lies at the centre? Here in the galactic core, a massacre is taking place unlike any other. These are amongst the oldest stars in our universe. They were born just a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. And now they are being devoured by a supermassive black hole. The largest black hole that we know of 
has a mass 66 billion times that of our own sun, which is a ridiculous number. Black holes are incredibly dense, and at their center is a point known as a singularity, which in itself is infinitely dense. It's difficult to analyze black holes because they swallow everything and anything. Nothing can escape their grasp, not even light. So it's because of this they are very hard to spot. The only way we can see them is when they interact with another body, by which point it might already be too late. There could be millions of black holes in our galaxy, just orbiting around with nothing to light them up. On average, in our galaxy, supernovas happen every 100 years. And yet we haven't had one for just over 300 years now, which means we are long overdue. There is a small chance that one of the stars in our night sky has already gone supernova, but the light hasn't had a chance yet to reach us. However, there are places in the universe where stars are packed so tightly together that they often collide. This is M13 one of the gems of our universe, or to be more specific, 700,000 gems. This is the great globular cluster in Hercules. These stars are packed over a hundred times more densely than our own stellar neighborhood, which means they often collide with one another and produce new stars. If it was possible for life to survive in such a disruptive environment, then their night sky would look very different to ours because theirs would be illuminated by starlight. Now, although my garden is very good for looking at stars, it isn't perfect. In fact, on a portal scale, it is around six, which still lets you see lots of stars, but there are ways to see more, and that is to get away from all the light and air pollution, which is what I've tried to do right now. I've come to what is the countryside near where I am, where the portal scale is five. Not much lower, but it should be low enough to help me see some other targets. As you can see behind me, we have a full moon. Full moons can be a problem for when looking at stars. And that is because, much like other light, they pollute our skies. They limit the amount that we can see. So if you want to see as many stars as possible, you want to do so when the moon is not out. Most importantly, when it's not full. Even if it's at a crescent phase or about halfway through, you can still see many stars in the night sky. But when you get to this point where there's a full moon out and it's a lot higher in the sky, you will be lucky to see even the brightest stars. Now just behind me is perhaps one of the greatest sights you can see with the naked eye. That fuzzy patch of light has changed the way we view our universe more than anything else in the history of mankind. It expanded our horizons further than anything else has ever done. It wasn't until the beginning of the 20th century that we really figured out what that fuzzy patch of light was. Up until that point, astronomers figured that that was a solar system in formation, but the truth was far more bewildering. It wasn't until Edwin Hubble was analyzing CFID variable stars, stars which vary in size rapidly, their diameter and temperature fluctuates, and from this, you can determine how far away a star is. 
Now, whilst he was looking towards this fuzzy patch of light, he noticed about 12 Cepheid variable stars that seemed to be very far away. In fact, on average, the distance they were from here on Earth was 900,000 light years. Now we know today that the Milky Way is about 100,000 light years in diameter. Back then, they estimated it was 300,000. But this meant that those stars did not belong to our galaxy. The stars we see around our night sky, these were the limits of our universe. This was all there was, or at least we thought all there was. But it turns out these didn't belong to our own galaxy. So where were they from? That fuzzy patch of light is the Andromeda galaxy. It's two and a half million light years away and it is the most distant point of light you can see with the naked eye. What Hubble discovered was another galaxy. Our universe didn't end with our galaxy. In fact, he realized soon after that there were plenty more galaxies out there, expanding our horizons further than anyone has ever done before or since. The discovery that these faint nebulae in our night sky were actually entire galaxies was a game changer. Astronomers began to revisit old targets that had already been classified. We could see thousands of galaxies through our telescopes. But perhaps the biggest revelation came only 16 years ago, when Hubble captured something unbelievably special. This is the most important image ever taken in our history. It is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. It was achieved by the Hubble Space Telescope when it pointed towards a seemingly blank portion of the sky and took an exposure that lasted more than 11 days. Now to us, this area seemed empty, but what it revealed was more than 10,000 galaxies. In this image, every point of light you see, all the distant, tiny specks, aren't stars, they're entire galaxies. Supermassive collections of stars, hundreds of billions, maybe even trillions of stars, trillions of other solar systems. No other image has ever expanded our horizons quite like this before. No other image has ever made us feel so insignificant and small like this before. It is the most outstanding reminder that the stars really are just the beginning. And there is so much more out there for us to explore. I'm Damon Scotting, and this was Astronomical. How would you like to have your name spaghettified by a black hole in front of thousands of people at the end of every single episode? Well now's your chance. Astronomical is produced just by me, which means the scripts, recording, editing, social media and costume design are all done by myself. And after the first two seasons, the budget is basically empty, which is why I'm now looking for donations towards the future of this science documentary. And they start at as little as one pound. If you want to watch your name be annihilated by a star as it swells into a giant before going supernova, then you can do so for as little as one pound. Or, if you'd like to watch your name be ripped apart into its individual atoms by a black hole in a process known as spaghettification, then you can do that for just five pounds. And then finally, for just ten pounds, you can take your place amongst the stars where you belong, because anyone that donates to science is a superstar. There we are, and if you can't donate at all, that's completely fine. Just make sure you like and subscribe, because that also goes a very long way. Cheers.